Welcome to our church Sunday service. We're so glad that you could join us. Whether you missed the service or you're watching on catch up, thank you for joining us. We hope that today's service will speak to you. We're praying that God will speak into your situation through the worship or the word. If you like any prayer, feel free to comment below on the channel or email us at hello at bravechurch.co.uk. Enjoy the service. Welcome. You're right there with your hand. <laughs> <laughs> that was weird. That was <laughs> you like a little deeper. Hi, Jess. <laughs> Hi, Jess. No, I need to not do that either. We want to give you a massive warm welcome. If it's your first time, your tenth time, or your hundredth time, we're just so glad to see you. If it is your first time, we would love to treat you to a coffee. So please head over to the Ask Me station, and somebody will be there to give you a token. This is Church News, so sit back, relax, and find out what's happening in the life of Brave Church. Coffee House is open every Wednesday from 9am to lunchtime. Feel free to pop in, whether that's to do your work, to have a chat, to bring a friend. We would love to see you. Good morning, Brave Church. We're really excited about the Vision Evening on Wednesday, the 2nd of March. We are going to be looking about the vision of the church and how we're going to move forward together. As part of the evening, we're going to be looking at the community element that Debbie described last week. But um, I just want to just mention about the four emphases, the, the reaching up, that as a church, we want to be a worshipping church. They want to be grateful for all that God has given us. We want to be thankful people. We want to move forward in our, in our praise and our worship. We want to reach in and we want to grow together in our faith. We want to be really practical in how we grow, but also we want to be really purposeful, that we want to be God-centred in all that we do. 
Also, we want to look about reaching out. We're a church that are called to reach our community, to make a, a positive influence into our community. So we want to look about evangelism, how we go out and, and reach people, and also how we, how we bring people in and share our faith by, by our good deeds. And lastly, we want to look at reaching beyond as well, that we want to be church, not just focused on ourselves, on our own needs, but we want to look to the needs of others in our community, in the UK and beyond. Each of us is unique and we've all got a special part to play in the church. I just want to read this scripture which encourages us and it's from Ephesians 4 and it says this. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly as each part does its own special work. It helps other parts to grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. Each of you have got a special part to play in the life of Brave Church and I'm sure we can all agree that we want to be healthy and growing and full of love. So we just want to invite you and encourage you to, to set that night apart, to come in and enjoy um, listening to the vision and being part of the vision and being the unique you that you are, that God has got a special place for you, God has called you into the life of this church and it's about discovering together what your part you can play in the life of Brave Church. As we've just heard from Craig, we have a vision night on Wednesday the 2nd of March at 7pm. You can sign up for this via the Church Suite app or you can email us at hello at bravechurch.co.uk. So as you know, church, last Thursday we launched our Thursday night online prayer room. The amazing thing is we're going to carry this on every week from 6 o'clock till 7 p.m. Now, you don't have to stay on for the whole hour. The amazing thing is you can jump in or jump out whenever you want. We believe that prayer is a key part of our faith. We believe in the power of prayer and it's an honour to pray together as a church. You can find the link for this on our website. If you go onto our website, click on the prayer section, scroll to the bottom and you'll find the link. Also, we have Alpha that's starting back up at the first week of March. Our Alpha course is perfect for you if you've got questions about faith, you're coming back to faith, or you want to know a little bit more about God. If you have any questions about this or you would like to join the course, please speak to Bernadette after the service or go and visit the Ask Me stand. That's all for Church News today. Thanks for joining us and yeah, have a great Sunday. Bye! <laughs>
And I thank you for that, God. And I thank you that, that all the days ordained for us were written in your book before one of them came to be. God, you've got plans for us. Plans that are, are to do us good and not to do us harm. And God, I pray for every one of us this morning that we would know that we are loved and we are valued by you. God, I pray that as we worship you, Lord, that you would speak to us individually. That, God, you would come and praise us yourself by the power of the Holy Spirit. And, God, you would do miracles in our lives. Things that nobody else knows about this morning that you would speak into. And you would bring freedom from. And you would bring breakthrough for. God, that you would just do the miraculous. Just as we're worshiping now, as we're singing together. That, God, you would break chains in our lives. You would bring a freedom and a hope. And give us a, a life to live again, God. Because it's in you. In Jesus' name. Amen.
other side just to concentrate on different aspects of what it's like to walk the walk of faith. And there's weeks where we've talked about getting into God's Word and about journaling. There's weeks where we've talked about communion and sharing communion. And this week we just want to just look at prayer, the important aspect of, of our walk with God. And you know, prayer, it takes form, in many, it takes place in many various forms. Jesus said, when you pray, so he didn't ask if you pray, but he said, when you pray, pray our Father who art in heaven. And this, this spiritual warfare, this prayer is where we, we declare in the heavenlies that, that God's goodness and God's grace over our lives. And this praise is what we've been singing in declaration this morning, this petition. You know, in Romans 8, 26, there's this, that there's times when we don't even know what to pray. Maybe you've been like that. You don't know what to pray because your heart is hurting or, or bursting. And the Bible says this, the Holy Spirit prays for us with groans. We can't express in words. Maybe you've been doing that unknowingly, praying in the Spirit. Various different ways to pray. Philippians 4, verse 6 says this, Do not worry about anything. It's God's word for you. Do not worry about anything. Are you worrying this morning? God's word said, do not worry. Instead, pray about everything. And I want to encourage you this morning. Don't worry, but pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all that he has done. Look that up when you go on. Philippians 4 verse 6. Don't worry about anything. And if you're worrying this morning, the word to you is this. Pray about it. Pray about everything. Whatever is going on in your life. The good things, the great things, the victorious things. Give thanks to God. And maybe there's times where you feel really downcast. Things are not going your way. The Bible says, pray about it. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. And we want to encourage you at Brave Church to be a praying church. You know, we've got lots of different opportunities. You've heard on church news, you know, each Sunday morning between 8 and 9, you've got an opportunity to come and just meditate and just pray and be quiet before God. If you've not got a family that is sent to, to bring along with you, well, you can come and you can spend time and now every Sunday morning praying. On Thursdays, 6 to 7, there's an opportunity together we can pray online in the comfort of our own homes. The 9th of March, we're going to have 40 days of prayer where we can pray together and we can seek God. But you know, this Tuesday, it's these Lent where we all have our pancakes and, and all put these new uh, these resolutions in or things that we're going to do over Lent. But I want to encourage you, rather than just going on a diet or giving up sugar or giving up chocolate or giving up cake, I want to challenge you this, this morning. Maybe for Lent, you can put time aside each day over Lent, starting from Tuesday. We can start today if you want. And just put a quiet time in where you can just pray and commit things to God. And as it says there, not to worry about anything but in everything instead everything we want to pray so we want to be a praying church and I just want to encourage you this morning to be a praying church you know each week we've got opportunities to thank God through our praise reports and in maybe that you've got things that you, you need to pray for and you need to, uh, the money to pray for you can write that down and on that end and we promise to pray for you and you know this week there's two people Karen who's asked for prayer and there's another there's another chap who is close to our hearts I don't want to name him this morning it's a personal thing but he's got cancer of the tonsils and he's going into hospital tomorrow so I'll just ask Stuart whatever he is I can't see through these these glasses he's going to just pray for these two people as we, uh, as we commit them to the Lord Stuart thank you yeah, I love it, God. We know that you are a God that answers prayers. We love it when we pray. And our prayers are a, a sweet incense to you. And it's an honour to be able to pray for these two people this morning. They're struggling, they're suffering, and we know that you are a God of love, that you're close upon the broken hearts. So we ask that you come close to them, that be there with them in every part of the procedures that they're going, undergoing scans and any operations, we pray for the medical professionals, that you anoint them, that you be with them, that you give them the skills to help the people, and that you surround Karen and this gentleman, I don't know who they are, but you know who they are, you know every part of them, you name them, we ask them to be close upon them, being there going out, they're coming in, on their left and their right, and you be over them, but, and we pray a good report over them. We know that you are a God of miracles, and we pray according to your will that you create miracles in this situation. They will experience you, they will experience your love, and your spirit, and your hand, as you 
He's such a loving God. He's such a mighty God. And we praise your holy name. Amen. Father, we just pray for the, all of Ukraine and our own that's going on over there, Lord. And as we see what's happening, our hearts break. So surely your heart, your heart must be broken over that country and nation. And we just pray for your hand to be on that situation. And that you will intervene. Pray that you will influence. That you will throw thwart the enemy, Lord, whoever that may be. Lord, we pray for those who are aggressive. Lord, we pray for the Spirit of God. To invade their hearts and their life, Lord, turn them around. Pray that you'll save people's lives. Pray that you'll use this for your glory, Lord. Pray that for a, a swift end to this, Lord. We just lift it up before you, Lord. Lord, we don't know what to do, so we we'll look to you. And we just hand, hand the whole, whole area, the whole country of Ukraine over to you, Lord. All the people who are influencing for good and for bad, Lord, we just pray that you will intervene. Pray for your will to be done in our nation. In the name of Jesus, we we'll pray.
to um, give my testimony um, because I think it's necessary for me to say what God has done in my life and that's the only reason why I want to do it because he has done his moves powerfully all through my life um, at different stages he's been there and he's never left me and I hope that this comes across in what I'm about to say so there's some key scriptures that I want to say first um, because they're really significant and they really meant something to me and they still do. So the first is, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He rescues those whose spirits are crushed. And that's from Psalm 34 verse 18. And the Lord will restore the years the locusts have eaten. And that's Joel 2:25. And then, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. And that's Jeremiah 29 11. And I'm getting upset because I know that this is real. And I know that these verses speak the truth. And if they can speak the truth for me, they can speak the truth for anybody. Because I am not worthy. Nobody is worthy. I know that, but I really am not but he still loves me and he's still been there. And you'll know, you'll understand that in a minute. And there's also Psalm 139 and it says, where can I go? There's nowhere that I can go, literally where God has not been with me. And it says, even in the depths, he is there. his hand will guide me. And it says, your right hand will hold me. God's hand has never let go of me. There's been many times when I have let go of him, but he has never ever let go of me. Finally, the scripture is, what the enemy intends for evil, God will use that for good. And that's from Exodus 50, 20. And there's just a, a sort of a hymn, a chorus that, that is really important to me as well. And it's the, the last verse and it says, no power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ, I stand. So I was brought up to believe in God um, and I did. From a very young age, I knew that God existed. Um, 
and you know I was encouraged to go to church, was in the brownies, was in the guides, did all that. Um, so I never, the fact that God is real, I never questioned that. But I didn't fully understand what it meant. I didn't know the gospel. I didn't know what Jesus necessarily had done for me. Um, I just knew that God was there. And I prayed um, every night. I used to say the same prayers every night. I'm not going to say what they are, because I will break down. But every night I did it. And, I'm, and, and no matter what was going on, I used to say these prayers. Well, then when I went to secondary school, things changed. I, I loved, I, I've always loved music and I really loved music then um, and I added, I was quite talented and I could play a brass instrument so I joined the band, there was a brass band in the school and the teacher of the band was also a science teacher at the school and long story short he started grooming me from quite early on in the secondary school and from the age of 13 he was sexually abusing me and this went on for several years um, and I couldn't tell anybody about it I couldn't I couldn't talk about it and I, I, I was it was just shame I was ashamed I felt dirty and grubby I felt like you know it was my fault um, and this went on for like a long time and I developed um, anorexia because basically I couldn't cope with what was happening. Um, lots of reasons why people develop eating disorders but abuse is one of them and, and it was really bad. I was really, really ill and you know my parents were desperately trying to help, desperately trying to understand but it, this abuse had turned me into somebody that I wasn't. I was extremely ill, I was moody, lied, I was a liar, I was, I'd do anything, I was deceitful, I was just not the person that I was. It, it changed me into somebody else and I was very, very ill. Um, so I ended up going into a psychiatric hospital because I finally I, I knew I, there was one day when I was so weak I couldn't get up the stairs and it frightened me um, and, I, and I did ask for help and the day after I was in hospital um, and I, I, I recovered fairly well I was well I got put weight on anyway mentally I still wasn't well mentally I wasn't well at all um, some say I'm still not but there you go um, but yeah I was really ill uh, still but I put the weight on and it was fine. And I really wanted to go in the army um, just to pursue the career of the band, really. Um, some of the other kids in the band had already joined and I really wanted that. But the main reason I wanted it was to get away because I couldn't see a way of getting away out of the situation. I didn't know what to do. But that wasn't meant to be because a few months after I got out of hospital, um, it just went from bad to worse, horrendous really, and a really serious offence was committed. And I was there when it happened. Um, and I was arrested for it after telling lies because I couldn't, I couldn't tell the truth. I couldn't admit to what had happened. I felt such shame and such guilt. People blamed me for what happened. They said it was my fault. And it was easier for me to face being charged and convicted of an offence that I didn't do. I was there, I was there, and I did lie, you know? And if there's anything I could do to change that, I would. But it was easier for me to do that, to go through all that, than to actually tell them what had happened. I could not tell people what had gone on. Um, and I couldn't for a long, long time. It was taken to court and I was sentenced. Um, both of us were. I was there with him. He was charged. I was charged. Um, and I ended up being convicted for the offence and I was in prison for a long time. And it was devastating. My family were devastated because they had no clue. <laughs> they didn't know what had been going on, you know. Nobody did. But God did. 
I was sent to a maximum security women's prison. Um, and I know prison's meant to be rough, but this was rough. So first night there, I just remember. Just crying out to God. Because I'd never felt so alone. I was, I'd, I knew what rejection was. People that I thought were friends rejected me. People turned against me. I was literally on my own. Um, I was ashamed. I was guilt, felt guilty. I felt nothing. I felt like I was nothing. And I remember I just cried out to God. Um, and he was there. He came to me and I have never felt love like I felt it that night. Um, literally, through what Jesus had done for me, <laughs> God was with me through the Holy Spirit. He, he filled that cell and, and, and he literally wrapped himself around me. Um, and I've got no word, I can't describe what that was, it was just love, nothing else, just love um, and I just, I remember just, I just fell asleep and then I knew from that moment that I was, I was his, he had me, I was committed, no matter what happened, I was gonna, my life was his. That all as I knew, that's, I didn't know anything else, I just knew that. Studied the Bible um, and I got to understand a lot more about who God was, who Jesus was, what they'd done, what he'd done for me. Um, and I just was passionate about it. And I also started a degree, which I finished once I'd got out. Um, basically, in, in, the, in the last year of, of, the, of the prison sentence, um, because I was committed and, and I used to work a lot in the, with the chaplains of the prisons, I was in three prisons altogether, um, all the chaplains were really, really helpful. Um, but there was one in particular that kind of knew there was something going on, they knew that there was a calling, if you like, on my life and I wanted that, I wanted to serve, I wanted whatever God wanted, I wanted that the plans and purposes. I, I did, I got out when I was 25 um, and within a few months I'd moved to Darwin and I was working in a church. I was volunteering at first but I was there and I was loving it and it was great um, and I was happy. I felt happy. One week we heard about this church that was over in Oswald Twistle. Um, and one of the people in, in the church where I was working just said, oh, we should take the youth over. So we did. So we all got in the car. I could drive then, it was that exciting. I learned how to drive. It was amazing. Um, and it was good. It was really good, actually. It was, it was bouncing, actually. You know, worship was really good. And yeah, I enjoyed it. And I met somebody there. Um, and he had a big character, really big character. Um, and I ended up just telling him <laughs> my life story. Don't know why, no idea why. Um, and I took my eyes off God. I allowed, I allowed me to, myself to be distracted. And the path that I was on, going for ordination, actually, I'd been, I'd, I'd had interviews with the Bishop of Lancaster and the, you know, they wanted me to go for ordination, so they were ready for sending me to Bible college, and, and I was like well up for that. But like I said, I got distracted. Ended up marrying him. And it was a mistake. Um, very unhappy, very, very unhappy. It wasn't a good marriage at all, for one reason or another. But I had two beautiful... <laughs> Beautiful daughters. And they make me whole. 
They are a gift from God, 100%. And um, I couldn't love them. I couldn't love them more than I do. But it's really important, I need to say this, my love is flawed. I am, I am, emotionally I'm not 100%. And that showed in the relationships that I've had. Um, I've been married twice. Both have been very difficult, very traumatic. Um, I've rushed into them, ended up being just wrong, wrong relationships. But God has always been there. He's got me through, no matter what's been going on, no matter how they've made me feel. All the condemnation, all the aggression, all the putting me down. God's been there and his love is perfect. So yeah, my love is flawed. You know, I've not been perfect at all, you know. So my girls have suffered as well. Um, but Hannah is my joy. No, Hannah's my sunshine, actually. I used to sing You Are My Sunshine to her <laughs> when she was a baby. So she's my sunshine and Lydia's my joy, literally, because she just, she's hilarious. Um, and neither of them realise how God works through them to me. <laughs> Because there's not many people I'll actually listen to, but I'll listen to them. And God uses them, you know. And I adore them. But he loves them more. And it took me a while to be able to say that, actually, because I thought nobody could love my girls more than me. But he actually does. And I know that, and I've learnt that since my elder Hannah got married and moved out. And I really struggled with that because I wasn't there and I couldn't protect her. But it was okay, because God does. God's got him, you know, he's, he's absolutely all over him. And just like he's never left me, I know he will never leave them. And it's so good, it's so comforting to know that. The counselling, my counsellor's actually told me that people used to ask me, <laughs> I do this, I waffle. People used to ask me when they knew that there was something wrong, because obviously there was something wrong. You know, there's, there's, I've always been sad. <laughs> And I was never able to put it into words. I could never say what it was. And my counsellors actually said to me, the trauma that I experienced affected a part of my brain that doesn't deal with the, vo the, the, the speaking. It's, it's a different part of my brain that's been affected. So I can't put it into words because there's no words for me to say what it is that I feel. I just know that it's, it's so heavy and it's so deep and it's so sad and it's broken me. But I know that God's putting me together, God's healing me, God's fixing it and this. The Lord is close to the broken hearted, he rescues those whose spirits are crushed. I've been broken hearted and my spirit has been crushed. My spirit has been fractured, shattered, but he's putting it back together again. And no matter how many times I've let go of him, he has never, ever let go of me. one chapter and there's been many other ones. I've had the privilege for years and years 
just working with Angela alongside her. Back when I became a Christians, back in the early 2000s, we worked together five days a week, volunteered for um, a cafe, bookshop, and um, it was just great to spend time with Angela. She input and poured out to so many people, and that's what she does now. She does that, you know, in her job. She helps people, she helps offenders, and just tries to steer them in the right direction. And you know, I was lucky enough to be at Angela's baptism in 1998. It will have been. I wasn't a Christian. I had never really heard um, a powerful story, as in Angela's full story. She didn't go unnoticed. She got into the baptism waters and she was out here pregnant with Hammer. And I was there by chance. If anything, I was still, if you will, in living in a dodgy world, but I had gone to watch my mum and dad and my brother be baptised, and Angela was part of that. And her story was so powerful. It didn't change me, because I believe there's a process, but it allowed a seed to just come into me and start to break down some of the walls. And that's what God does. You know, only a year after I was sat in a cell, I was used to being in cells, but this particular cell and why Angela's story came to mind was I had been arrested for the eighth time in the space of two weeks and it was for a very serious charge. And I remember sitting in that cell. Did I have an encounter like Angela did? No, because that's Angela's story and we all have our own stories. But I remember sitting in there listening to kind of my brother's testimony. It rose up. And I believe when we share testimony, we might think that the other person's not listening, but it becomes alive because Jesus is involved and it rises up in us. And I remember sitting in this cell and I didn't cry out saying, you know, like, I feel so alone. And you know, Angela's testimony is one that it means that Jesus will come anywhere. She was totally confined in a cell, but yet she found freedom in that cell, true freedom. You know, we can have open doorways, we don't have to be in a cell, but we can feel so locked up inside. And you know, that's what Angela reminded me of. And I remember looking at my life, and you know, the reason I looked at my life really is, I was used to paying people to go to prison for me. That is the depth that, that I had sunk to. And one particular girl, my friend, who had gone to prison for a long time, in the past four men. She went to prison, she was happy to. I paid, I paid for her children to be looked after by grandma. Everything was all right. That's the sort of world I lived in. And you know, she got out of prison and within a month, within a month of her getting out, one of her sons died and that broke me because I'd robbed that girl, I'd robbed that child of having their mother around. And here I was again plotting and I'd caught up this moral thing that I would never ever do that to another person. I would take the rap, I would do whatever and here it was going through my head. And if anything I was scared, a fear came over me, a fear, who am I, what can I do, you know like how do I do this, not a fear of going to prison, I was scared of myself, the death that I had sunk to and you know that was my story that's what it was and I, what, I'm not saying that to gloat but I do believe we all have our own story and we have a powerful story that can save others from going um, you know and Jesus will reach down I know he's great the bottom of the barrel to get me and to rescue me but you know when you hear testimonies don't ever think that yours isn't important. You know, right at the beginning of um, being a Christian, I started travelling around the country, and some of you might know a guy called Barry Woodward, but I used to go alongside him, he would share the message, and I would tell my testimony. And one of the things that used to really, really upset me, and it's the reason I kind of stopped going is, every time I would go to church after church, and we would share testimony, and Gary, uh, Barry would do his message. There would always be someone from that church, whether it be a worship leader, 
um, a youth in the congregation, a, you know, a woman on the desk, and they would say one thing that would really upset me. They would say to me, I wish I had a story like yours. I wish I had something that I could share with others. And that really upset me because do you know what? You have got a story. Everyone has got a story. And I need people's stories. My children need people's stories of people that have been strong enough to say no to a lot of the things that I said yes to. And you know, that's what Jesus does. Every story is important. There should be a picture of me coming up on screen. Look at that beautiful face. I don't mind saying I was pretty. I had a little cuteness. I was six years old there. It was uh, the Silver Jubilee and there were street parties. And I had a fantastic mum and dad. They gave me everything and so much love. But you know, even at that young age, at six, I'd already started to make decisions that was going to lead me to the pathway that I was on. I was already a fighter. A couple of years after that, you know, I, I think my mum and dad will vouch. There wasn't a day or a week, should I say, that I would get home and there wouldn't be somebody's parents sat there with their son or their daughter. And they would be terrified, saying, your Val just said they're going to come through the window and they're going to carry on beating them up. That is what I'm like. That's what I was like. Why was I like that? Is it because people and children, because I look at our, our children now, they know more about Jesus than I ever knew when I gave my life to Christ. Is it because I didn't see anyone around sharing their stories, sharing what they'd learned in a children's church? As I got to secondary school, I don't remember one Christian being, this is what Jesus can do for you. That is the power of testimony, you know, the, and, and the importance of each and every one of us sharing our stories. I needed people around me to say there's a different way of living. My mum and dad needed people to say, do you know what? Jesus can transform your lives. Take your children to church, see what God can do. God can either save them um, from even going that way or he can give them the strength to say no. But we didn't know. And that is why it is so important that, you know, we use our testimonies. Don't ever shy away thinking you haven't got a story. I still need your stories. If I'm going to keep on track, I need people's stories who yeah. said, you know what? You can have strength. Do, you know, help, I'll help you. I'll do it this way. You know, that if you look at Jesus himself, I love that he had a... A real power and a clarity when he spoke. You know, when, when people asked him questions, he would answer saying, I am. And you know, you look at that and it, it's not like I'd say, I am going to the shop. He said it because he was clear and definite and confident in who he was. He knew he was God. And you know, I wonder today, are you confident in who you are. It says this with Jesus on the night he was getting arrested. He was in the garden of Gethsemane and you know Judas had already betrayed him and he was taking the soldiers and it says this in John 18. It says when he had finished praying Jesus left with his disciples and crossed the Kidron Valley. On the other side there was a garden and he and his disciples went into it. Now G Judas, who betrayed him, knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas came to the garden, guiding a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests and the Pharisees. They were carrying torches, lanterns and weapons. Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out and asked them, Who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. I am he, Jesus said. And Judas the traitor was standing there with him. When Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. And I really believe that that's a message for people to say, when you know who you are, when you are confident, there is a power that comes from the Jesus that you know and have encountered. You know, when, they speak, when Jesus said, I am he, 
the, the, the enemy drew back and they fell backwards. They didn't fall to the knees, they, they didn't fall down worshipping Jesus, but a power came in. And I believe it's the same power that comes through us as we share testimony. It starts to break down walls. Yeah. You know, if you look at the Apostle Paul, he was another one who was just totally confident in who he was. If you don't know Paul, Paul was actually called Saul. Uh, before he met with Jesus, he went out killing the Christians. He, he was on the attack all the time. He didn't know and understand about this Jesus. And then he had an encounter with him on the road to Damascus. And, you know, everything changed. His whole life changed. The reason we kind of know the stories of the Bible is through kind of people like Paul. But I love how Paul addresses himself because he's very confident in who he is. You know, if you look at Romans 1, it says this. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. And I just love that. You could just do a whole sermon on how he calls himself Paul. The one thing that he did, he was confident he was no longer Saul. He didn't call himself Saul. He was very confident. And if you read all about Paul, he, he's the first one to say, everything I want to do, I don't do. And everything I don't want to do, I end up doing. But that did not distract him from who he really was. He knew and very confident and clear that he was Paul. He was a servant of Christ Jesus. He knew he was on a mission. He knew what his purpose was. He was called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. If you look at some of the other writings of Paul, he says, I'm sent to the Gentiles, not to the Jews. He was very confident on who he was, what he was supposed to be doing, and not what he shouldn't. And I wonder today, have you got that same clarity? Mm. Do you know who you are? Do you know what you're called to do? Because that will empower you to keep going. And I think one of the confusing things for me is I compare myself to others. So I love Sheila Lawrence. She is one of the very first people who kind of brought me through, helped me. I needed people like Sus and Nigel to be around me because they could teach me a different way of living. But if I was to compare myself with Sus, I would never be on this platform. I don't have fancy words. I'm not, you know, as elegant with my prayer life as, as Sus is. But I'm not supposed to be here. You're not supposed to be anyone else. If you look at David when he fought Goliath, all his brothers were around him. They were all there. And they were so busy comparing themselves to Goliath that they never did anything or made a difference. But what David did is he looked back, he remembered when God had worked in his life. So when he looked at Goliath, he could see that his God was bigger because God had taught him and God had been there with him when he'd killed a lion, when he'd killed a bear. So Goliath was nothing. And you know, for some of us, just because we are comparing is stopping us from doing the things that God wants us to do. For others, it might be praise. People will tell us. They will say, and do you know what? I think you'll be really good at that. And that's really good, but usually that confirms what God has already put in your heart. And if you know God, then you will find yourselves in him. You know, maybe today you're thinking, what on earth is she on about? I'm just coming here and I'm so messed up. And here's the thing, there's a, there's a story in the Bible, and actually it's written in three of the Gospels, so it's important. There's only four Gospels, and actually three are relating to this particular story. And it is a story about the rich young ruler. And we know he's a rich young ruler because you look at the accounts, and it will say, kind of, he was rich. And in another it will say he's young, but he's a rich young ruler. And he's not somebody that's gotten his wealth by ill-gotten means. He's just worked really well in life. But he knew that was not everything. And you know, he's there in this crowd as Jesus passes by. 
And all of a sudden, he starts to run out of the crowd because he knows that what is it? Is, it means nothing. There's something missing from his life. And he runs out from the crowds and he drops at the feet of Jesus. Well, that story intrigues me anyway because I don't really see rich people running about. They have a swagger, don't they? They know that they can move through things. You know, they're, they're pretty in... in in shape of who they are and they want to be respected and that's the identity that they live up to but for some reason this was different he knew that the presence of jesus he had to be in it and he dropped at jesus's feet now if you go home and read that story this man doesn't end up acting on what jesus tells him to do but the one thing i want you to grab today and maybe if this is the only thing that you will take out of here today is, when Jesus looks at this man on the floor, he looks at him and it says, Jesus looked at him and he loved him. And I wanna give that message to you today and just yeah. remind you, Jesus loves you. Jesus wants you. Jesus needs you. He has chosen you. He has equipped you. It's all in you. And you might be on your knees in front of him and you know, you might be thinking to yourself, I've nothing to offer. I can't even sit clearly. My life's a mess. But when Jesus looks at you, he looks at you in total perfection for what he did on the cross. You don't have to live in that same thing. He looks at you, and as Angela said herself, he loves you. Nothing can stop that love. Only us, ourselves. You know, I'm just gonna ask the band to come up. How do we do it? How do we find ourselves? If I was to go on the search for myself and look for the real me, I'm just going to get more of the old founder. I'm going to get more of the same. That's not how it's supposed to, to be. And maybe for you, that's what you're struggling with. You're struggling with your whole identity. It says this in Ephesians 1, verse 11 to 12. It says it's in Christ that we find out who we are and what we are living for. Long before we first heard of Christ and got our hopes up, he had his eye on us. He had designs on us for glorious living. Part of the overall purpose he is working out in everything and everyone. Just to hear those words again, it's in Christ that we find out who we are and what we are living for. We're not gonna find it in the world. It goes on in Colossians 3 verse three, it says this, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Well, I know when I'm playing hide and seek with our grandchildren, I've got to search for them. They're hidden and they want me to find them. And that's Jesus, he's saying I'm there, I want you to come in to the places, I want you to search for me. And you're gonna find me, and you're gonna find the real you. It's not about what anyone else says. It's not about what anybody else thinks you can't do because of what's gone on, the mistakes and the messes. And I hold my hands up, and I'm sorry if I've made anyone feel that way. Because it's about what Jesus can bring. It's about what he's predestined for you. He wants you to have glorious living. You've got a testimony, you've got a story, you've got something that's going to break down the power. Angela's story inspired me and it's good, it's good that stories inspire you. But if you get to the place where you need a little bit more, you've been inspired, then comes a response. We've got to respond. I remember being in a church service. I'd heard all the different stories, I'd got to church a few times. There came a point in my life I had to respond. My life wasn't changing until I met that response. I don't even know what happened, I had a broken toe. I remember being right at the back because I was trying to hide away really. And they gave a response and I knew I was a bit like the rich young ruler. I just had to go and throw myself at his feet. And I remember walking up well, running up 
and you know I'd hobbled in there but something gave me the strength and I dropped to my knees and you know it's only at that point when I acted on the inspiration that had started to grow inside me that the transformation came just a process we can't leave it all to Jesus he wants you to search and to seek and to find him he wants you to respond so how do we do it if it's hidden in Christ how do we do it we worship we get closer to him we can do that through worship we get into his word we start to discover what is he saying we spend so much time trying to prove ourselves and prove ourselves to others and Jesus just says but you've been approved why are you proving yourself I've approved you maybe you need to hear that today you are approved you are worthy yeah. whatever mess is it you're in he can reach you he can, he can come to you just like he did with Angela and yes there might be some consequences yes there might be some things you need to talk through but Angela never stopped doing what she was called to do. She got on that track just like Paul did. And she said, I might have these issues and I might need some help, but it's not going to stop me moving into that glorious living, that plan, that purpose. That's what he wants for you today. But will you allow yourselves to just come before God, to surrender all and say, I've made a mess again. Or I haven't shared my story because I've been ashamed of my story. Don't ever be ashamed. You know, I share testimony because I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I could cringe at some of the things I did. I'm not proud. But it's the power of the gospel. It's the power of Jesus that breaks in, even in your darkest moments. And if it can save one person going the way that I went, then I'm all for it. Because there is power. In the name of Jesus. Yeah. The name of Jesus that's, that wants to set you free. Why don't we worship and respond to God?
what I would say is, don't not do something. You know, when God speaks, He's giving us prompt, He's pushing us in the right direction. And it, there's a battle that goes on the inside. I know, you know, it's, there's this fight that goes on like, oh, I don't know if I can, I don't know if I've got the courage to, what will people think? Do you know what? I don't care what people think. This is yeah. between you and yeah. God, yeah. and this yeah. is your journey. So we're going to carry on worshiping, and I just want to encourage you, if you know, because we do know, you know, there's that whole settling on the inside, and we know we've got to do something. If you know this morning that you just need someone to stand with you, to pray for you, to pray over you, if you just need to know that there's stuff that you need to speak out, because there's power in confession when the, the stuff that's going on in our lives that we know we just need to speak out, then I want to encourage you, come to the front, there's a team of people available, ready to pray with you. We're going to carry on worshiping. That was such a powerful and life-changing message. We believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. If that message really spoke to you and you want to give your life to Christ, we want to give you this opportunity. You can do that by saying the following prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, I acknowledge that I need a savior. I confess today that you are the Son of God and the Lord of all. I ask that you forgive me of my wrongdoing. I know you died on the cross for my sin and rose again so that we would have victory and freedom. I now give you my life. Help me to follow you and experience you in all my days. I trust you. Amen. If you said that prayer and gave your life to Jesus, we would love to take the next steps of life with you. Email us at hello at bravechurch.co.uk and we will be in touch. A new wind is blowing